So I've mentioned that we are in the series called The Point, and we're talking about our core values, who we are as a church. The reason why that I wanted to go into this series at this time with our name change and getting ready in about six months moving into a new facility that I need us and I need to know, you need to know who we are as a church. Our staff got together about a month ago. We sat down and rewrote our vision statement and our core values. And we want to share those with you and let you know exactly who we are as a church. Our vision statement is very short, and I've shared it with you for the last four weeks. And it simply is this. We lead imperfect people to a perfect God. In every ministry and everything that we do that functions out of our church here, we are leading imperfect people to a perfect God. And then we want to talk about our core values. What are those values? Number one, the first value, I talked about community and the power of us working together, coming together. Week number two, we talked about the second core value, we live selflessly. That we realize as Christ came into this world not to be served, but to serve. Our mentality, every time we come together, I'm coming to serve someone else. The third core value is we need your seat. Talking about every seat in every service is incredibly valuable to us. And we want the lost sitting in these seats, and we want people who are influencers and who will influence the lost for the cause of Christ. And then we talked about the fourth value. We invite you to come as you are. That when people come to this church, we don't want them to have to clean up and change anything, but we want them to come just as they are. Isaiah 64 says that come in your filthy rags. And Jesus said, as you come, Come as you are in your sinful condition, and he's the one who will make the transformation and change their lives. And now we enter into the fifth core value, and the fifth core value is we act in audacious faith. We act in audacious faith in order to dominate a city with the gospel of Jesus. We cannot think small. We will set impossible goals, take bold steps of faith, and watch God move. This is our fifth core value. So let's get started. Do you remember the uh, term magic eye images? You know, they're still around, but about 15 years ago, magic eye images were very, very popular. And I remember uh, our family was on vacation. We, had, we were in a mall, and we were walking through a mall area. We came to one store, and the big window it had this, this huge poster, and it was the magic eye image. And it's a poster, a picture of all of these colors all mixed together. And, and I mean, there's nothing there but just designs. And what you're supposed to do is gaze into that picture, and as you gaze into it, a 3D image will jump out at you. I mean, just appear before your very eyes. Well, we were standing there looking at this, and I'm looking at all of these colors and and this picture, and some other people have gathered around, and and I don't see anything. I mean, it's just all kind of blurry to me, and and I'm straining and trying to see something, and I want to see a 3D image pop out. But standing around me, one by one, I would hear people go, oh, my word, oh, my goodness, I see it, I see it. It's incredible. And I'm thinking, I don't see anything incredible. And then one of my own little boys at that time spoke up and said, Dad, I see it. I see it. It's three dolphins coming up out of the water. And I'm looking at all these splotches and these colors, and I'm thinking, well, maybe that splotch is a, is a dolphin. And, you know, is it abstract or what is that? And, and very disappointing to me that I could not see what they were seeing. Well, they were ready to go to the next door, next door, and they all went that direction. And I'm standing there gazing at this picture thinking, and I'm squinting, and I'm, and I'm thinking, why can't I see that? And I'm crossing my eyes. I'm doing everything that I can. And then all of a sudden, whoom, I mean, out of that thing came a 3D image like it jumped off the page. Three dolphins coming up out of the water. It was one of the most incredible things when it just popped off that screen. And all of a sudden, I see it, and I'm going, hubba, 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 hey, 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 come back, come back, come back, come back. I see it, I see it, I see it. And then I look back, and I, it's gone. I, I mean, I can't see it, and I can't get it back again. But for a split second, I was able to see the 3D image pop off. And, you know, I was able that day to see something that, I had never seen before and something that many people never saw that day. You know, we all see things differently in life. It's amazing how that I may may see one thing one way and you'll see something totally different. And it's also very interesting that there are always people and always in all of us that there is an unseen side of success in this life. You know, we all want success. We all want uh, great things. You know, when you think about success, we, we want, uh, we want to, to have a great marriage. We would like to have a great family life. You know, everyone wants an athletic body. Uh, those are things of success. But 
there is an unseen side of success. And whenever you look at someone who has a great marriage and you say, I wish I had a marriage like theirs, what you do not see is the unseen side of the discipline and what they've gone through and maybe the valleys that they've walked through as a couple. The, uh, the laying their lives down, I mean, the discipline that they have added to get them to where they are. Uh, there are other people that look at someone else and they'll say, I wish I was godly like they are godly. I wish I could be a Christian like they are. But what you don't see is the unseen side of their Christianity, the valleys they've walked through, the difficulties, what caused them to get to where they are, the discipline that they have spent in building their relationship with God, and you don't see all of that behind. When you look at someone who has an athletic body and you say, wow, I wish I had a body like that, what you don't see is that person getting up at 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the morning and running mile after mile, working out with weights and eating the right foods and, and, and walking away from other foods and the discipline that they've added to their lives. It's the unseen side of success. And anything that we want to succeed at, there is always the unseen side to get us to that place. Whenever you think about greatness in life, then you always have to think about certain words such as discipline, sacrifice, pain, and risk because they're all involved in something that is great. When it comes to serving Christ, when it comes to our Christian life, we want to do it successfully. We don't want to do it half-heartedly. If we're going to serve Christ, we want to do it with all of our might, with all of our strength, and as a church, we want that very thing. As a church, all of us coming together, we have that mindset. And as a church, we will not think small. And we will set impossible goals. And we will take bold steps of faith. And the question is this. What does Jesus expect out of us? If we're going to rise up as a church and really do something magnificent in this city that God has placed us, what does he expect out of our lives on an individual basis? And Jesus told a, a story, a parable in Matthew chapter 25 of the talents. Many of us have heard this story many, many times. But it was a story where he said a master came to three different guys and he came up to one man and he gave him five talents. And talents are a sum of money. He came to another man and gave him two talents and to the third he gave him one talent. And he said, do whatever you will with what I have given to you, but I will return to see what you have done with what I have laid into your hands. He was gone for some time, and when he returned, he came back to the man who had five talents, and the man gave him back ten talents. He had doubled what he had. He went to the next man, and he had given him two talents, and the man gave back to the master four talents. He had doubled what he had. Listen to what the master said in verse 21 when these two men doubled what they have. He said, well done, good and faithful servants. Come and share your master's happiness. Well done for what you have done. The unseen side of what these men did, they took a risk. They were handed something. They were given something in the very beginning, but they had to take a risk. They had to lay it on the line, and they invested what they had. They took a chance, but the chance paid off the risk. That's the unseen side of what they did. But then there's a third man who was given one talent. He didn't have a lot, but he was just given one talent. And here you find the man played it safe. That he was not willing to invest it because he was afraid that he would lose it. He was afraid to do anything with it. He did not even put it in the bank to draw interest. He just held on to it. And when the master returned, he gave back the master exactly what had been given to him. In other words, you could say, say the man lived at a status quo level. And listen to what the master said to him. You wicked and lazy servant. Throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's very easy to see the parallel that he's drawing here with the weeping and gnashing of teeth as he relates that to the place of hell. What he's saying here is that anyone who has taken on the very principles of Christ and know about Christ and know about the goodness of what Christ has done for us. And yet, we live life at such a status quo. In other words, we live our life at a lukewarm level. And we know in Revelation that it says, and God will spew the one out of his mouth who lives lukewarm. There is something that God does not like about people who understand the power of God and the sacrifice that Christ has made for mankind and yet not take it seriously. Listen to this. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29, how much 
more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has trampled as an unholy thing the blood of Christ? Wow, that is an amazing thought. Someone who has accepted Christ, someone who knows about God, someone who's been exposed to the Word of God year after year after year, and they know the principles of God in their heart. They know that there is a living God. They know that Christ came and gave His life for them, and yet receiving such a great gift or receiving such great information, and yet they treat it with such little worth, of little importance. In other words, what they do is they live their life at status quo. They live their spiritual life at a lukewarm level. And it's one of what God ever intended. Audacious faith is absent among most believers because we don't understand our spiritual role. We don't dominate our city for the gospel of Christ because what we have done is that we have reverted back to an Old Testament mindset. And this is what is fascinating to me is that we in America who know the Word of God so well, and yet we have allowed ourselves to go back to an Old Testament mentality. Let me explain what I mean by that. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit worked through three, uh, primarily three different individuals, the priest, the kings, and the prophets. Primarily out of those three, he would work through the priest. And the priest was the mediator between God and mankind. And when God wanted to speak to man, he would speak through the priest, and the priest would speak to the people. And when the people needed something from God, they would go to the priest, and the priest would go to God. It's an Old Testament setup. But when Christ came to the earth, and he lived, and he died, and he rose again, and when he stood on that hillside that day and he ascended into heaven, the last thing that he told man was, hang on, don't go anywhere because I'm leaving you, but I'm sending the Holy Spirit now upon you to abide with you and to abide in you. What happened at that very moment is that the Holy Spirit would move upon every believer in the same power and the same anointing that the Holy Spirit worked upon in the Old Testament on the priest now falls upon every born-again believer who accepts Christ, and we are empowered by that power. Listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Emphasizing here that we are a royal priesthood, that there is an anointing upon every single one of us who have accepted Christ, the anointing as priest. I want you to imagine with me if every Christian took on their priesthood seriously, filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, acting in audacious faith, and causing us to take bold steps of faith because we understand exactly who we are. But again, what the church has done is we have reverted back, we've retreated back to an Old Testament mindset, and somewhere around 90% of the American churches operate in the wrong way. Listen to this. See if you can identify by churches you've been in how it works. A church is looking for a pastor. They bring in a pastor and they let him preach on a Sunday morning. If they like his preaching and like his personality, then they will invite him to stay as their pastor, and they will say, we would like to hire you as our minister. And as they hire him, this is what we would like for you to do. We want you to preach and teach and marry and bury. We want you to make hospital calls and visit new members and counsel the confused. We want you to evangelize the community, raise money, pray for the sick, and attend everybody's functions. Then at the end of the year, we'll have our annual business meeting, and if you have met all of our expectations, then maybe we will vote you in for one more year. After all, we are paying you to do ministry. Tragically, this is the most widely practiced church paradigm that you'll find in America today. And this is the reason why that the church is limping. Why today the American church is powerless and frustrated and ineffective. It's why that in America that 80% of all churches are under 200 people. That there is a decline today in America of people going to church and this is the reason why. 
Let me go to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12 and give you the purpose of the pastor. Pastors are to, pre, are to prepare. In other words, they are to equip God's people for works of service. So the body of Christ may be built up. The pastor, the role of the pastor is the captain of the troops. He trains and he equips the people. He is the visionary and he gives the marching orders. And the church reaches out to the world. This is what the church is. We are the church, all of us together, and we exist for the world. But when we have the mentality that pastors minister to the lay people, pastors service the lay people, what we have created is an ingrown, focused organization. The confusion is we think of ministers and lay people. In the church, we have a handful of ministers, and we have a lot of lay people. Realistically, the way Christ set up the church was that we have a handful of trainers, and we have hundreds of ministers. And that's the concept that has been lost. The only thing that really stops the enormous power of God is our lack of understanding of who we are in Christ. Every person who sits in this auditorium who has a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have been anointed as a priest. And this mentality and this thought in America that pastors and evangelists, they are the men of God and they have this enormous power and boy, God works through them and that I'm just a lay person is absolutely false teaching. I truly believe as a minister, looking back on this thing, that pastors have been on an ego trip for a long, long time and love the idea that I'm the man of God. I'm the one that has the power. I'm the one that is able to lay hands on the sick and see them recover when realistically, that's not the fact. Realistically, any born-again believer, anyone who has been anointed by the Holy Spirit by accepting Jesus Christ has the same power flowing the same power that I have, the same power that you have, and the same power that the Old Testament priest operated in. Every one of us have the same power flowing through us. The problem is we don't accept who we are and we don't understand the power that flows through us. There was a story in Mark chapter 4 of where Jesus had been out ministering all day long and it had been a grueling day. They now had ended that and they climb into a boat late that evening and they start crossing the Sea of Galilee. What that means is that they're traveling across that sea in the middle of the night and Jesus climbs up in front of that boat, up kind of underneath and falls sound asleep. It says when they were about in the middle of that sea, in the middle of the night is when a violent storm came upon them suddenly. It was a violent storm, the Bible says, and the waves were tossing, and they were in a small boat loaded with men, and they became very fearful because now the waves are coming up over the boat. It feels like the boat is going to, to collapse under the power and the strength of these waves, and these men start panicking. Fear starts gripping them because they realize this is not some minor storm. This is a storm we're not going to survive. This is going to capsize us. We're not going to survive it, and now the scene is panic-stricken. They're yelling and screaming and bailing out water as fast as they can, and they're trying to stay afloat, and they're just trying to somehow stay in the boat when they realize that in all of this turmoil that Jesus is peacefully sleeping in the front of the boat. These guys were in need of a divine intervention and they needed it now. How many times have we been in this situation? How many times have you found yourself in a storm, in a crisis, when everything is caving in? When your marriage is caving in, your family is caving in, your personal life is distraught. It's when you've lost your job, when your finances have crashed, and you're in a situation when you need divine intervention and you need it now because you're about to go under. You also know as a born-again believer, you know deep down inside that Christ resides in you that Christ lives in you, Christ is nearby, but as you call out to him, there's no response. You call out to him and 
there is no divine help. As you call out in your time of need, in your place of storm, in the middle of the storm, it almost feels like he's fallen asleep and your prayers are falling on deaf ears. And I can tell you that day in the boat, as they're screaming and yelling at one another and they're frantically fighting to keep that boat afloat, that they're not happy with Jesus. He's peacefully sleeping, sleeping in the midst of the storm. And they're yelling at him now, saying, don't you care? Don't you even care that we're about to die? Jesus is awakened. And he opens his eyes, and he looks around, and he sees the dark clouds around him, and the wind is blowing, and the waves are coming over into the ship. And he sees into their eyes the panic and how that fear has gripped every one of them. In the midst of that storm, Jesus stands to his feet and fights his way to the front of that boat. As it's rocking and moving back and forth, as he fights his way to the front, he stands at the very front, he holds out his hands and he simply speaks to the storm and he calls out peace peace be still immediately the wind stopped blowing and it says immediately the waves settled down and now they're floating out on this lake and there's not a ripple from just a matter of seconds, they've gone from screaming and yelling and panic to just sitting there facing the front of the boat, staring at Jesus, and everything is eerie calm. Have you ever been in a situation of where you have felt that, that eeriness of such a great calm? I remember as I read this story this week that I flashed back to when I was 12 years old living in Amarillo, Texas, in the panhandle of Texas, known as, as Tornado Alley, where many tornadoes come through there. And it was on one spring day that I was sitting in the house and I was alone, noticing that the winds were kicking up and I looked outside and dark clouds were moving in, and I mean, it just looked bad. It kept getting worse and worse, and then I heard that dreaded sound when the siren went off alerting everyone in the city that a tornado was coming. It had been spotted. When that sound went off, panic gripped me. Being in that house by myself, I ran out the front door and out on the porch and started looking around. And as I stood on that porch, it was the eeriest feeling that I'd ever had. There was not a sound, not a movement, no wind. Everything had stopped. It was like Everything had been sucked out of the atmosphere. It was this eerie calm. When I looked across this field and far in the distance, I saw the funnel cloud coming as it came down out of the clouds, and there was the tornado. What I was experiencing was the calm before the storm. What these men were experiencing in that boat that day was the calm after the storm. The calm after Christ showed up. Sitting there in this eerie calm, not a sound, like everything had been sucked out of the atmosphere, they only heard one man whisper, the whisper that everyone could hear, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the waves obey him? When you think about this story, what manner of God do you serve? Is it the kind that can calm the troubled sea of life? Is your God the kind that can heal the blind eyes? Is he the one who is in control of every storm? At the very mention of his name, hell trembles and heaven stands still. And Jesus turns from standing there at the front of the boat and he looks back at these disciples and he says to them, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? In our storms of life, when everything is caving in, when you cannot see the future, you don't understand tomorrow, and fear has gripped your life. Do you still have no faith? Do you still have no faith with the one that is sitting in the boat with you, the one who resides with you? He's sitting right beside you. This word faith is a strange word. In Hebrews 11 and verse 1, it says, Now faith is being sure 
of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Again, reading that, how can we be certain? How can we be so sure of something that is invisible to us? How can we be so sure that God's going to show up when I cannot see God with my natural eye? And the only way that you can ever be sure is by the evidence of what God does and what he has done in your life. For instance, in physics, you find that solid visible matter has invisible energy. Albert Einstein was the one who proposed the formula that forever changed the perception of the physical universe when he presented to us E equals MC squared. When the atom is flooded with electrons, it releases this incredible force. It's where we get the atom bomb. That energy and power is invisible until it's properly released. It's invisible, but its effects are incredible. Our God is invisible, but over 30 years of ministry, let me tell you, the effects of our God is incredible. When I look back upon my life and raising a family and being in marriage and pastoring a church, I could write volumes of the evidence of what God has done. It's not by what I cannot see, but it's by the very evidence of what this invisible God does. And that's what brings faith to our lives. You as a born-again believer, a New Testament priest, filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, can do the impossible. You know, I was looking back this week, and in 1999, Apple Computer at that time was really fairly small. Apple Computers had not really made much of an impact around the world. And it was in 1999 when they got a few men together, and they started asking the question, what would happen? What would happen if we gathered around us just some crazy people, crazy thinkers, people who were crazy enough to believe that we could change the world? What would happen? I want you to take a look at this commercial from Apple. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers. The round pegs in the square holes. The ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. What would happen if we went back to the model, the model that Christ designed for us and gathered enough crazy people to believe that by being empowered by the Holy Spirit, understanding that my role is not a layperson, but it is an absolute empowered priest, that I'm a priest wherever I go, could we change the world? Could we change our city? Could we make such an incredible difference that this city would never be the same because a handful of crazy people who believed the role of who Jesus Christ said we really were and that we operated in that? As a church, we want to operate with audacious faith. As a church, we want to move forward and do amazing and incredible things. Can we do the impossible? If we believe that, we're, that we are priests, you see, as we walk out of this place, it's understanding that you're in full-time ministry. It's not looking at me saying, you're in full-time ministry, but it's where you say, I'm in full-time ministry. And when we walk out of this place, wherever we go, then I'm constantly ministering to my spouse. I'm constantly ministering to my children. I'm constantly ministering in my neighborhood. When I go to school or when I go to work, that I'm constantly ministering to those people that are around me. What you're doing is you're operating and you're functioning in the way that God has created you. 
And all of a sudden, what we have is not a pastor and lay people, but we have a trainer and we have ministers that are moving across this city, making an impact wherever we go. You carry tremendous power. You, tr you carry within you the spirit of the living God that you have the ability to lay hands upon the sick and see them recover. You have the ability to speak life into others. You have the ability to heal a marriage. You have the ability to heal a family. You have the ability to overcome any obstacle or any addiction in your life because you are a priest. You are a priest anointed by the Holy Spirit. I'd like for you to bow your heads for a moment, and I want to pray with you. What we're doing is we're reestablishing ourselves as a church. We're preparing ourselves for something incredible and something great. But we'll never be great until we're crazy enough to believe what the Bible says. Until we're crazy enough to believe that we're going to break out of the mold that America, the American church has created and go back to the model and operating the way he called us to operate. I set the vision. I rally the troops. I present the marching orders. And then together, we go across the city and make a difference. As we pray today, pray for this anointing to come upon you. You're a priest. In your home, you're a priest.